So turn with me to Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5, our study uh, tonight starts at verse 1. I'm not going to do any kind of lengthy review of what we've looked at thus far, except to point out that in the previous chapter, Eliphaz began his response to Job's brief meltdown in chapter 3. And in that rant, there's really no other word for it, but in Job's putting words to his grief, uh, he expresses his tremendous uh, pain and the anguish that he had been suffering. Uh, And they were so great uh, that they had begun to get the best of him, causing him to express uh, regret uh, even over his being conceived and born. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you this, but it takes uh, a lot uh, to make someone like Job, someone of Job's stature, uh, so desperate so as to wish he had never been born. And we can certainly relate to that on a human level. Uh, This is why I said last week, and I'll say it again, we shouldn't uh, be too hard on Job. None of us understands what it's like to go through some of the things uh, he's going through, much less to go through those things and not have any idea why you're going through those things. And so, again, uh, Eliphaz explained to Job that instead of complaining against God, uh, instead of lamenting the... Uh, conception, the day of his conception and birth, Job would do well to humble himself. Job would do well to recognize that God owed him nothing and could, in fact, do with him whatever he pleased. Job would do well as well to understand and trust that everything that was happening to him was not happening apart from God's watchful eye and providence. Even in this, God is in control. Even in the midst of the chaos, God is in control. Even in the midst of uncertainty, God's in control. And we would do well to remember those things ourselves, wouldn't we not? God is sovereign. God is on the throne even still. Uh, No matter how crazy the world gets around us, no matter how unsettling the things that are happening might be, we need to settle on that primary reality. God is yet on His throne. Nothing that's happening is taking God uh, by surprise. Everything that's happening is happening according to His sovereign will and ordination. Well, if you missed last week's message, I would encourage you, as I always do, go to Sermon Audio, give that a listen as the Lord uh, allows. But here in verse 1 of chapter 5, Eliphaz continues and He says to Job, Call now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? Now, at this point, it's important to remember that Eliphaz and everyone else who knew Job likely believed that it was possible, if not probable, that Job had in some way and to some degree sinned himself into his current predicament. Steve and I were talking earlier today about how that's just our knee-jerk reaction. Uh, We talked about this last time from John chapter 9 when uh, the man born blind uh, was about to be healed. And they asked Jesus, whose sin was it? Was it his sin or the sin of his parents that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said it was neither. Why was he born blind then? So that God's wondrous works might be shown forth. For no other reason than God might fetch more glory for himself. Now, Eliphaz, as we saw last time, remarked in the previous chapter that complete destruction, the kind of destruction that it looked like Job was headed for, only comes to the worst of the worst. Now, he also kind of gives a little bit of relief to Job by pointing out to Job, Job, this is not like you. You know, in the past, you've been the one to support and exhort, and encourage people. But now that the same sorts of things are happening to you, all you can do is complain. And it's really not a good look. It's really not something that you should be doing of all people. Now again, not knowing about God's sovereign allowance, where God had permitted Satan to test Job in the ways that he had been tested, Uh, Again, Eliphaz is counseling Job on the suspicion that he had done something to bring about 
all that was happening to him. So as a way of testing the validity of Job's faith, Eliphaz says what he does here. He exhorts Job to call out to God and see what happens. Right? Eliphaz's approach here was rooted in the ancient belief, and again, we see this uh, over in John 9, verse 31. It's rooted in this belief that God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. So Eliphaz's logic is fairly simple. Call out to the Lord, and if He answers, great. That means you haven't sent yourself into this predicament. And oh, by the way, if you call out and God doesn't answer, call out to any of the holy ones and see if anybody answers. And again, Eliphaz is convinced that Job has sent himself into this predicament. And so he's saying, Job, if it's not true that you've sent yourself into this predicament, then just call on the Lord and the Lord will come to your aid because God hears the prayers of the repentant. Again, uh, it's important to understand exactly what's going on here in Eliphaz's mind, uh, which is the supreme indication that he doesn't know anything at all about this aspect of God's dealing with men. Remember, this is very early on in redemptive history. This is uh, at a time where uh, even a lot of the prophets have not yet spoken. Uh, this is where very little of the Word is actually inscripturated at this particular point. And so, uh, Eliphaz is kind of in the dark himself. Eliphaz, I doubt that it ever dawned on Eliphaz that God sometimes allows people to be tempted and tried and persecuted and go through all manner of difficulty just because God is trying to prove something about faith and about righteousness. This is, after all, what he said to Satan, right? Satan comes into heaven and God says, Have you tried my servant Job? He's upright. He's blameless. He fears God. And so Satan, thinking that that's a challenge, says, well, I can get him to curse you to your face. And the onslaught begins. So Job's experiencing the things he's experiencing, again, unbeknownst to Eliphaz, because God considered Job to be a, an example of righteousness and faith. And again, Eliphaz probably just didn't understand that, as we might expect. Incidentally, this phrase, the holy ones, it's likely a reference to the angels uh, who were known, uh, even at this time, for being God's messengers. Uh, but again, Eliphaz has a charge that he's going to lay against Job. Now he gets even more specific. He actually offers four suggestions for the type of sin that Job may have committed leading to his current woes. Anger foolishness, or some of your translations might say wickedness, jealousy, and naivete, or simple-mindedness. He said, for anger slays the foolish man, and jealousy kills the simple, or naive. Now here's where things get a little tricky from a translational standpoint. There are some scholars who believe that the anger that, slaves, that slays the foolish man is God's anger, the anger that He pours out on those who are foolish. Others, though, believe that the anger referred to here is the anger demonstrated by the foolish man who is then slain by God on account of both his anger and his foolishness. And that really doesn't matter. Because in the end, anger and foolishness are both sins which if unatoned for, will bring the wrath of God upon a, a person, right? So it doesn't really matter if what we're talking about is Job's own anger that's going to kill him, or if his anger and foolishness is going to be his downfall before a thrice holy God. It, it really doesn't matter. And uh, thankfully, commentators don't make that big a deal of it because they have the same idea. Any sin that goes unatoned for will result in the wrath of a thrice holy God. But as for the sin of anger, we have numerous places in Scripture that talk about this. Let me just give you a few. If you're taking notes, you can just jot these down. Proverbs 14, 29, Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. What that means is, 
he who has a quick temper is foolish. Proverbs 16.32, Whoever's slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Proverbs 29.11, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Ecclesiastes 7.9 Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Psalm 37.8 Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Ephesians 4.31 Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. James chapter 1, 19 and 20. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. One of the best examples of teaching along these lines in the Old Testament comes from the Lord, or in the New Testament comes from the Lord Himself. Matthew 5:22. Remember what he said there about murder? You've heard it said, Thou shalt not murder. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. I was talking with John and Kara and a couple of others throughout the day about one of the, at least to me, one of the sadder testimonies about the church at large is that there's so much anger. There's so much angst. And it's coming out in pulpits. It's coming out in the sycophants who follow those angry people in the pulpits. And it's coming out in ways that are just unseemly and should be uncharacteristic of believers. Now again, we read from Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4.26, we're told, be angry and do not sin. The key is don't sin. Well, what's the difference between anger that's sinful and anger that's not sinful? Well, you can be righteously indignant about any number of things. I mean, just go online for 20 minutes and look at the news, and you'll find ample reason to be righteously indignant. But what we're not allowed to do is allow our righteous indignation to become a calling card, to begin calling people names, lambasting them, speaking in terms that are not loving. Jesus himself uh, tells us that this kind of anger has no place among his followers. We're taught, are we not, to be as cunning as serpents, yes, but as gentle as doves. Now, how do you do that? Well, again, you can be righteously indignant, but if you genuinely have the spirit of one beggar telling other beggars where bread can be found, if you genuinely have this understanding that you're nothing apart from the grace of God who has made you something only in God's sight, if you truly understand exactly who you are apart from Christ, then you'll have a much easier time tolerating those who are yet outside of Christ. You'll be more inclined to show grace and mercy and love, and compassion. The reason I spent most of uh, that message a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, loving our enemies is because that's exactly what the Scriptures teach. The Scriptures teach us that we're to be patient. You know, we speak of loving our enemies with what kind of love? Well, with the same kind of love that Paul advocates in 1 Corinthians 13. What kind of love is that? It's a love that bears all things. It's a love that believes all things. It's a love that does not take into account a wrong suffered. It's the same love with which you and I have been loved by Christ. Anybody here making a claim that you were deserving of the love of Christ? I hope not. 
When you were the most to be despised, Christ loved you. When you angered Him the most with that thrice holy righteous indignation, He loved you still. When you anger Him today, when you quench the Holy Spirit, when you act in ways that are contrary to what He has commanded, when you do things that are sinful, willfully, what does the writer of the Hebrews say should happen? For him who goes on sinning willfully, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but the fearful expectation of judgment. The only reason we're not subject to that judgment that should be thrown on us is because of the love of Christ. And that same love has been shed abroad in your heart and mine and should be on display everywhere we go. They'll know we're Christians by our opinions. They'll know we're Christians by the size of the big stick that we carry to beat people with. They'll know we're Christians because of the number of listeners to our podcast. No? They'll know we're Christians by our love. Not just for one another, but for our love for them. As Eliphaz says to Job, anger kills the foolish man. Anger will be your downfall if you don't get a grip on it. If you don't let it go. As all of these passages, and we could, there's a hundred more to add to this, right? So what's he implying? Well, he's implying that Job's anger and the foolishness which brought it out of him might have been the source of Job's present difficulties. And again, that's a fairly easy assumption, isn't it? One only has to read again what Job said back in chapter 3 to conclude that he's obviously angry with God. I don't know that he would have outright said that, but anytime you go to God and complain to the extent where you're saying, I wish I'd never been conceived, that, that's anger, right? Eliphaz then goes on in the second half of the verse to suggest two more sins that might have played into Job's situation. He says, and jealousy kills the simple. Now, you might be asking, in what way has Job demonstrated either jealousy or naivete? Well, once again, commentators are divided over this because while some can see what could have caused jealousy on Job's part after the trials began, that is, his envy of his friends and others who were not being tried in the same way. I mean, that's a common thing for us, isn't it? I mean, have you ever been really sick? Maybe in the hospital? You know, and you're watching all the healthy people walk around? <laughs> I mean, this happens to us as we get older too, right? Right? I mean, you watch TV and you see all these young people like bouncing around like, like fawns in a, in a meadow, and, and you're like, I could do that once, right? You know, why do they get to have all the fun? Why can't I do that anymore, right? There is a, a, a modicum of jealousy that enters in when you're in Job's shoes. He's seeing his three friends who have come to sit next to him, He's seeing them. They're not suffering the way he's suffering. He might have considered himself to be more righteous than they. He might have been more righteous than they. It wasn't God who sicked Satan on them. So again, we're speculating here, but Eliphaz uses this particular charge for a reason. Maybe it's because Job had demonstrated a slight bit of envy or jealousy that his friends weren't suffering in the same way. Now, I think even at that point, Eliphaz himself is speculating. It's clear he doesn't know exactly what's going on. But he's grasping at straws, is he not? He's trying to find some reason to explain Job's suffering the way he has. And he's using uh, the only faculty that he has at the moment, which is his own human reason. He's saying, I've seen it. 
Time and time again, I've seen where this kind of thing happens. And so I can only conclude, Job, that you're guilty of the same sorts of things as those in whom I've seen this. This is why he goes on in verses 3 through 5 saying, I've seen the foolish uh, taking root, and I cursed his abode immediately. His sons are far from safety. They are even oppressed in the gate, and there's no deliverer. His harvest the hungry devour and take it to a place of thorns, and the schemer is eager for their wealth. Uh, now this is really confusing, right? What in the world is Eliphaz going on about now? Well, Eliphaz, who I believe is a godly man, I, I think he's just in the dark in a lot of things. I think he's speculating, maybe unfairly, but he's just kind of using the faculties that he has. But Eliphaz uh, would not have thought it okay to curse the foolish man or his possessions. That's not what's being captured here. That's not what this passage means. So what does it mean when he says that he had seen the foolish taking root and he cursed his abode immediately? This is a, a turn of a phrase. It's, uh, it's not a Hebraism. It wasn't a common thing, but most commentators believe that what he's saying is wherever he sees evil begin to take root, wherever he sees foolishness, wickedness uh, take root in a person, his automatic conclusion is that that person is not a person of faith. That person's not a righteous person. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I account that man as cursed. He's not declaring a curse on that man. He's saying, I consider any man who exhibits this kind of foolishness that I've seen, this kind of wickedness, I am able to discern that they're probably not right with God. That's all he's saying. Now, he's also saying that such men are cursed, and as such, in due time, they will end up losing they will end up losing it all. While they continue to prosper in the things that they've secured through their wicked deeds, Eliphaz says their sons are in danger of being persecuted as well. Now, how might that work out? Well, if you have a... Let's put this in the, in the worst terms imaginable. I mean, if your father is a mob boss, uh, you'd be naive to suspect that you're not going to have enemies as your father's son, right? Right? We see it happening all the time. You know, if you are wealthy or from a wealthy family uh, and you're fairly well known, I would not drive into Mexico. Why? Because cartels are notorious for swooping up rich people and then putting a bounty on their heads. And, you know, if they don't get the, the ransom, then they do all kinds of really horrible things to the person, right? So what's going on here is Eliphaz is saying where he's seen this kind of evil take place, it's not just the father who suffers, it's the sons who also suffer. Uh, this reference to being oppressed in the gate, uh, that's a fairly interesting thing to consider. I mean, the gate of the city was where all commerce happened. People passing by, people coming in and out of the city, uh, this is where all of the last-minute business would be taken care of. The gate of the city was so busy that it was customary for courts in the day to set up their court at the gate. And so to say that they're oppressed in the gate means that while everybody else is, is high-fiving each other and shaking hands and talking about uh, the old days and whatever old men do at the gate, like the Proverb 31 woman's wife, or husband, right? These sons are persona non grata. They go to the gate and everybody shuns them. They go to the gate because they know to be involved with these children of this evil man would not bode well for them. And so what Eliphaz is talking about is the ripple effect of being associated with the evil and angry man. Um even the wicked man's supply of food is not safe, Eliphaz says, because the poor uh, that he has suppressed and lorded his riches over, they come into his fields and they devour his harvest. 
And they do so even up to the hedges of thorns uh, that were installed to prevent theft and pilfering. You know, back in the day, if you had a cash crop and you wanted to protect it, mainly from critters, uh, you would put uh, a row of thorns around the field uh, so that any critters trying to get in there would not do so. Um, what Eliphaz is saying is that the rich man is so detested, so hated by those he, he oppresses, that they'll even go through the thorns to get to what he has. Right? Additionally, there will always be schemers or robbers that will be a problem for the rich man. You know, if you're rich uh, and you're in a place where there are enough poor and unprincipled people, you're going to have a problem with robbers. You're going to have a problem with schemers who will try to take whatever portion of your wealth they can get away with. Now, again, it's not clear at this point whether we're talking about an accusation being made against Job. Maybe, jo or maybe Eliphaz is just speaking in general terms. Maybe he's saying to Job, Job, be careful that this is not you. Because I've seen it time and time again. It doesn't end well. right? Or he might be making an accusation. Kind of like Nathan with David. Thou art the man. Job, I'm talking about you. We just don't know. We don't know. But again, whether he's in full-blown accusation mode, whether he's just speaking in general terms, it's fairly clear that Eliphaz thought Job had done something. In fact, Eliphaz's next words are fa fairly telling. He says in verse 6, For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground, for man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. Basically, Eliphaz is reminding Job that the kind of suffering he's enduring just doesn't come out of thin air. And again, what Eliphaz knows about the one true God is that God punishes wickedness. God punishes wickedness. Job, you're obviously being punished. Ergo, you must be wicked. Right? Because God just doesn't willy-nilly... Again, unbeknownst to Eliphaz, God just doesn't willy-nilly cause such suffering to take place. We know better, though, don't we? We know that oftentimes the things that we endure, the trials and the persecutions and all of the difficulties that we face, a lot of times they're not born of sin at all. A lot of times it's just God's way of growing us. It's God's way of molding and shaping us more into the image of Christ. You know, the health and prosperity preachers don't like that because they insist that God doesn't want anyone to suffer. Well, tell that to Job, first of all, right? And then tell that to the countless martyrs over the years who have suffered horrendously, uh, not because they've done anything wrong, but they suffered horrendously in most cases so that they would be made more fit for heaven, so that they might go through that final fire of sanctification before being transported to glory. Again, Eliphaz doesn't really understand all of this, and we can't really blame him. But he says, just as sure as sparks of a fire fly upward, there must be something that Job had done to bring all this about. And it's really on the basis of this not-so-veiled accusation that Eliphaz says in verse 8, But as for me, I would seek God, and I would place my cause before God. That sounds like good advice, doesn't it? It is, but not necessarily in the way that it's worded. Be very careful that when you give counsel along these lines, when people are suffering, when people are going through things that, and again, this is what makes empathy such a, a, an egregious sin in my limited understanding of the whole thing, but the moment you assume the role of an empath and you say, well, if it were me, I would do thus and such. Let's get this straight. It's not you. 
And as well-meaning as your counsel might be, it would be better worded to say, look, whenever we experience trials and suffering, we would do well to go to the Lord and to seek His face and to ask for Him to intervene. Don't do it like Eliphaz does. And I double-checked and triple-checked the language here, and this is exactly what Eliphaz is doing. He's coming across as sanctimonious. Well, Job, if I were in your shoes... But wait a minute. Eliphaz had not lost all of his livestock. Eliphaz didn't lose his sons and daughters. Eliphaz didn't have a, a case of boils all over his body. So, I mean, it's kind of disingenuous, is it not? For Eliphaz to say, well, if it were me, then I would seek the face of the Lord. If it were me, I would place my cause before God. Be careful. Let that be kind of a, a practical outworking of this passage. Now, I'm not going to ascribe nefarious motives to Eliphaz. You know, I, I think he meant it in the helpful way. I think he meant it to be encouraging to his friend Job. After all, we don't see any backlash from this, right? As a matter of fact, we're going to see, Lord willing, next week that nothing Eliphaz has said to this point makes even a dent in Job. <laughs> because, yep, you got it. Next week, chapter 6, Job's just going to continue with his pity party, right? But that said, uh, I think, you know, the simple answer uh, when we counsel others who are suffering, is simply to say, uh, I feel really bad for what you're going through, but God. God has a purpose. God can apply the balm of Gilead. God can soothe you, comfort you, heal you. Trust in that God. We should all trust in that God because he is God. Now, the reason I think Eliphaz had pure motives is because of the way he goes on from this point to describe God. He goes on to encourage Job by reminding him of all of God's precious perfections. All of who God really is. Let's just read it beginning at verse 9. I'm going to be adding a bit of commentary as required. Uh, for clarity's sake, but Eliphaz reminds Job that it's their God who does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends water on the fields so that He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. No more comforting words can be spoken to the one who's suffering. God will take pity on you. God will raise you up when you're down. God will lift you to safety. This reminded me of what Jesus said to His disciples, again, in His Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 3 and 4. Remember what Jesus said? He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's a guarantee, folks. Now, as, as Pastor John pointed out, and I kind of piggybacked on that during our study of the Sermon on the Mount years ago, these things are not uh, prescriptive. The Beatitudes are not prescriptive, they're descriptive. Meaning, if you are a child of God, you'll be able to understand this. You'll be able to acquire these truths, these promises for your own. Right? The unbeliever has no understanding of these things. And the unbeliever has no business latching onto these promises as their own because these are things that are characteristic of all who believe. Those who believe are going to be poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Those who mourn will be comforted. Verse 12. Speaking of God still, he says he frustrates the plotting of the shrewd so that their hands cannot attain success. He captures the wise by their own shrewdness, and the advice of the cunning is quickly thwarted. By day they meet with darkness and grope at noon as in the night. Now stop there. What does Eliphaz mean when he says that those who are wise in their own estimation 
meet with darkness and grope at noon as in the night. This is believed to be a reference to the innate blindness of the unredeemed. The unsaved man, I mean, he might, um, he might have some modicum of success throughout his life, but not true success. The unredeemed man might hit on certain things that will bring him riches and glory and fame, but the unredeemed man is still groping around. In other words, they're like John chapter 3. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus about those who hate the light. They're in the darkness. And whatever success they might find in their lost condition will only be temporal. It'll only be enjoyed while they yet walk this earth. Only God's children enjoy eternal blessings. Only God's children understand true success. This is again why I love Joshua 1.8, right? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it night and day, right? Doing all that's written in order to observe it. And then, what are we guaranteed? We'll have great success. What kind of success? The only kind of success that matters. True success. But as it is with the unsaved, they're kind of just groping around. And it really is a, a reference to man's blindness in the face of God's clear revelation of Himself. Not only in creation, but in terms of special personal revelation or uh, the proto-gospel that is found in all of the prophets. Even in Moses, even in Genesis, you have the uh, proto Evangelion, the, the, the proto-gospel in the promise that uh, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. The same thing's true today. There are many who are blind, even though God has made Himself abundantly clear. Romans 1, man's without excuse. When it comes to acknowledging God exists, why? Because God has made that evident in all that's been created. Now again, that's not sufficient to save him. That's a special work of God through the Holy Spirit, through the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit. But still, man wanders about groping in the dark for that which he can never find apart from God's grace. Listen to Gill here. He says, this may be applied to the case of many in a land of gospel light who are in darkness, who walk in darkness, and are darkness itself, though the light of the glorious gospel shines all around them on others. These know no more of divine and spiritual things than the Gentiles, but grope or feel about like persons blind and in the dark as much as they who not only have the great things of the gospel hid from them, and Satan blinds their minds, lest this light should shine into them, but they run into darkness, as the words of the first clause may be rendered. Those such as the Jews were and the deists now are run from the light of divine revelation and love darkness, and which is the aggravation of their condemnation. In spite of the tremendous amount of light that exists in the world, and I know a lot of people say, what light? You know, there's not a whole lot of light in the world. Well, there is. There's a lot of gospel light in the world. I mean, every family, uh, almost every family on planet Earth now has either access to a Bible or owns multiple copies of the Bible. It's there. There's all kinds of people who are dutifully, faithfully going out, spreading the gospel. Churches are seeing a resurgence. People are coming into the church. Now, sadly, not all of them are hearing the truth that come into most churches, but they're coming into churches to hear, thus saith the Lord, the gospel light is shining bright. So why don't people see it and react in order to be saved? Well, may God be pleased to bring revival. Because that's the only way they're going to see it. It's not going to be through activism. It's not going to be through the efforts of man. 
It's going to be through revival. And might God be pleased to bring revival to this entire planet using human instruments like you and me. But let's not dare be so cavalier as to think that we can usher this in ourselves. You can't do it. That's not a defeatist attitude, by the way. That's not a... What was the phrase somebody used? Um, All you old people are just doomers? Is that... I'm not a doomer. I realize that at any moment, and guess what? Not only do I realize it, but I pray for it. That at any moment, God might stir the souls of men. That God might bring revival, just as on the day of Pentecost, on a much larger scale. And every person on planet Earth would become a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That sin would be a thing of the past. That Christ Himself would rule with a rod of iron. That all of those dreams that our post mill friends Uh, long to see fulfilled, would come to fruition. That's not a doomer, folks. What is that? That's someone who recognizes that if and when that happens, it will only be because God Himself has been pleased to make it happen. And might I be found faithful in helping to do my part, ministering my gift, so that that becomes a reality if He so wills. But again, only if He so wills. It might be that many, 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 many more tough years await us because God's trying to tell us something. He's trying to teach us something about Himself. Understand, whatever happens in the realm of man happens at the allowance and at the sovereign decree of a thrice holy God who is still on His throne. And if you share my vision, if you share that dream that God might bring about revival, He's not going to bring it with a set of headphones on your head. He's going to bring it when you go out and you do the work of the gospel instead of just talking about it. Oh, how nice it would be. Yeah, it would be nice. You know it would be nicer? If you get up off your rear end and go out there and do something. Right? It's the whole meaning behind be doers of the word, not just hearers. Rant off. Verse 15. But he saves from the sword of their mouth and the poor from the hand of the mighty. The sword of the mouth. Oh. The wicked and the shrewd are able to lead many astray, some to their eventual doom, with nothing more than their mouths. You know why James said that the tongue is the most powerful instrument in your body? Because it's true. You can do more harm with this than you can do with the most able weapon you can craft. And the wicked man does just that. They're smooth talkers. They've learned to use their tongues as weapons. And as I thought about this, I was reminded of Paul's warning to Titus in Titus 1, 10 and 11. Remember what he wrote there? For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, the religious the elite, those over whom so many people fawned, so many people hung on their every word, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they're upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. As Eliphaz said to Job here in our text, the Lord is able to spare His children from this kind of thing. And aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that there is no substitute for the Word of God? That there's nothing more powerful? Remember what the writer of the Hebrews said? Hebrews 4? 
The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce as far as the division of soul and spirit, to, to dig right into the very marrow of our spiritual bones and to help us understand things about ourselves that we would never otherwise understand. So what does Eliphaz conclude about all these wonderful works of God? Verse 16. So the helpless has hope, and unrighteousness must, must shut its mouth. Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty, for He inflicts pain and gives relief. He wounds, and His hands also heal. From six troubles he will deliver you. Even in seven, evil will not touch you. Those are meaningful numbers, seven being the number of perfection. It's almost like the 70 times seven passage. You know, Peter asked, how many times should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? No, 70 times seven, meaning completely, utterly. Same thing was used back then. In famine he will redeem you from death, and in war from the power of the sword. You'll be hidden from the scourge of the tongue, and you will not be afraid of violence when it comes. You will laugh at violence and famine, and you will not be afraid of wild beasts, for you will be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field will be at peace with you. You will know that your tent is secure, for you will visit your abode and fear no loss. You will know also that your descendants will be many, and your offspring is the grass of the earth. You'll come to the grave in full vigor like the stacking of grain in its season. Behold this, we have investigated it, and so it is. Hear it and know it for yourself. Eliphaz says these are time-tested, proven arguments. We've seen God act in these ways time and time and time again. Not only have we seen it, we've investigated it. We've looked into it, and we've determined that these things are true. Now, Job, believe it for yourself. In other words, if you believe these things to be true, Job, you'll not react the way you are to the suffering you're enduring. Even if your suffering is brought on by sin, believe these things, and it will be well with you. Eliphaz knew firsthand that God was worthy. He knew that God was worthy to be praised, worshipped, and he knew that God could be counted on to assist his children, even Job, if Job would only place his trust in him. And Job responded by saying, yep, you're right. I just temporarily forgot what I know to be true. Job says, now I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm going to get a grip. And I'm going to heed your wonderful counsel. Is that what happened? Not quite. You can read ahead, but Lord willing, again, next week we'll, we'll look at his response in chapter 6.